So what, what, what we're going to do today is take a deeper dive into just focusing on buried bridges. Uh, this is uh, intended to be an introduction uh, because we have such a large expanded audience here. Everybody is at, I'm sure, at different levels of experience and knowledge on the subject. So this is intended to be an introduction. If there is something in here that you'd like to hear more about or covered in more detail, please let the short, st short span steel bridge alliance know. Um, and, and we can follow up with you on that, e either with, uh, you know, with a future workshop or webinar, or, or you know, it helps us to guide the, the web resources that we, that we make available. Um, so that information is, is always available. This is one of those subjects that we could do in, a, you know, probably a, a half a day or a full day series if somebody was, was interested. So hopefully we'll, everyone will get something out of this and come away with some, you know, some desire to learn a little bit more and understand things better. So what we're doing here, as I said, is just an introduction. <clears throat> um, and, and as part of that, we'll just go through uh, what, what Barry bridges are, first of all, uh, where and how they're used, some of the advantages as compared to traditional bridges and rigid structures. And then I have a few case studies that, that illustrate a few of the different applications. Um, as well as uh, some snapshots on a few other projects. And then after that, I'll hand it off to Mike McGough, who's the, the technical director of the National Corrugated Steel Pipe Association. And he'll talk a little bit more about some of the tools and resources that the NCSPA has. So the term Barry Bridge is, is fairly new. Uh, it's been around for about seven or eight years or so now. Uh, but Barry Bridges in general have been around for, for over 80 years. Uh, these are generally defined currently as bridge length structures as defined by ASHTO uh, as having a span of more than 20 feet. Um, they're buried structures that, are, that work through soil structure interaction with the granular backfill to support loads. So the, the structure itself as well as the backfill are both part of the bridge system. Um, so and that, that allows them to carry quite a bit of load and, and do a lot of things that you can't do with traditional bridges. In addition to that, these are all corrugated metal, corrugated steel, and they are flexible and they're able to handle a lot of differential movement. And there's some definite design and construction advantages with having that, which I'll touch on a little bit more later. This the buried bridge subject has been has been involved with has been part of a, a number of uh, webinars, conference sessions, and workshops with the Transportation Research Board, the Association of County Engineers, various DOT webinars, um, touching on, on additional subtopics dealing with design, accelerated construction, resilience, durability, and service life, uh, larger span applications, load rating, low volume roads. So this, this is a relatively new term and, and there's been a lot of work done recently to help educate stakeholders and, and engineers and contractors about them. Everything that you'll see here today meets all ASHTO LRFD materials, design, construction, and load rating requirements. It's not proprietary. Um, and these are these are engineered structures. So they're they're designed to be used in a certain certain application at a certain site. Uh, you don't pick these out of a height of cover table. Um, and that's done using finite element analysis. So these are these are true engineered structures that can be designed to meet your requirements. So when when we're talking about buried bridges, uh, flexible buried bridges, they're they're generally structural plate materials. Um, and currently, there are in the U.S. there there are two steel corrugation profiles available. Uh, the the six by two corrugation profile here is. Uh, it's fairly common. These are generally drainage type structures, spans up to about 20 feet or so. Um, and then there are also, I, I don't have it pictured here, but uh, aluminum structural plate is also fairly common. It's a nine inch by two and a half inch corrug corrugation profile. So a little, little bit bigger, a little bit stiffer than the six by two. And those also are primarily used for smaller drainage applications. Uh, what we're talking most about today is this 15 by five and a half inch corrugation profile. Uh, this is the deepest corrugation profile manufactured in the US. Uh, this, the profile itself is about nine times stiffer than the six by two and over six times stiffer than the aluminum profile. 
Um, and, and in terms of the design yield strength, this, this 15 by five and a half profile is more than 33% stronger than the shallow corrugated steel and, and about double the design yield strength of aluminum. So what that means is with, with this corrugation profile, which, which has been around for about 40 years now, uh, but in the last 10 years or so, there've been a lot of advances in, in terms of analysis and some field testing to, to verify this analysis. And we're getting more and more confident with some of the designs we're doing. And the result has been that we can do, go with much longer spans and much higher, uh, much higher loading, uh, which, which puts the, the bit main benefit of these, of these types of structures into the realm of where you'd be looking at traditional beam type bridges. Um, and then in addition to that, because these are flexible, they have a fairly high settlement tolerance, and there are some advantages in terms of footing design and performance that go along with that. <clears throat> oh, I'm going to very quickly go through the manufacturing process to help you visualize how, the, how these are made and get a better feel for um, the, the level of quality and, and strength and workmanship that's involved with it. Uh, the, the steel used for these structures comes on steel coils, about 40,000 pounds each. After a, a project has been designed and the design has been approved by, by the reviewing engineer, <clears throat> then that material gets sheeted out into individual steel plates that are specific to the sizes required to construct that structure. And that's what you see in the picture at the right here. Once the, once the material is received in the, in the manufacturing facility and has gone through a quality check to make sure that the plates are the right size and dimensions and thickness, uh, then they get corrugated to, to make the corrugation profile. So in pictured here, this is a, a plan with a thousand ton press with a die in it that matches the, the corrugation profile. You slide the plate in, you push the press down, and then when it comes out, the plate is corrugated. And they, then it's stacked there on, on the bottom left for the next step of the process. Um, after it's been corrugated, then the plates all get the holes punched. The, these, these plates are bolted together to form the structure in the field. Um, so the bolt pattern is specific to that design and that plate. Uh, it's fairly easy to customize based on any kind of special layout requirements. Um, some manufacturers are also able to punch the plates at the same time that they're being corrugated. After the holes are punched, then, then that's when the, when the plates are formed to the correct shape to, to build the structure on the site. Uh, these pictures show a, a three-roll process, which is, which is computerized. The, the, program, the, the, the three roll is programmed to give, you, give each plate exactly the correct radius on it so that when they're bolted together, they, they make the, the required shape on site. Um, there's this revol results in a high level of repeatability and consistency among the plates as they're being assembled. Uh, there's additional process that also involves uh, forming them using a using another press or a bumping process, which gives you the same result. After all the fabrication has been completed, uh, and just before the the plates get loaded to be delivered to the site, they be, they sent out to be galvanized. Um, so that's this hot dip galvanizing. So it's, it's a high quality, high quality process, um, and it provides a, a high measure of durability for the plates on the on the site. So after, and that's after any fabrication. If there are any cuts or or anything special in addition to just the fabrication of the plates, that that all happens before the plates are galvanized. And then at, at that point, they're, they're ready to be shipped to the site. They get loaded onto flatbed trucks, like what's shown here. Uh, one, of the, one of the big benefits with these types of structures is that you can put, for example, a 40-foot span by 40-foot wide bridge on one single legal flatbed load. Individual plates will weigh anywhere from about 400 to 1,200 pounds each, depending on how long and, and how thick the steel is. So they can be handled on site using forklift trucks and and other, other equipment. You don't need to have a big crane to, to build with these types of structures. And if necessary for remote sites, the loads can be broken down and plates can be carried in individually or in the back of a pickup or carried with a, with a skid loader. Um, th there's a lot of flexibility there and, and these are becoming pretty popular in, in remote forest service type areas. 
So when we're talking about advantages and applications, it's it's really kind of the limit of your imagination. There, there are a lot of people who will see these these structures and the flex, flexibility flexibility there is with custom geometries and special shapes, and, and they come up with some pretty interesting things to do. But listed here are, are some of the more common things. Uh, wildlife crossings and aquatic organism passages are, are very common now, uh, especially I've noticed in, in the Northwest and also in a lot of the uh, <coughs> Uh, national forest areas. Uh, the picture here is actually a wildlife crossing in Wyoming near Yellowstone Park. Uh, a lot of these projects are value engineered because as as other projects go go through the project cycle, they'll find that they they become cost prohibitive and um, and they want to look for an alternative to a to a, a beam bridge or or a precast structure or something like that. So um, you're, these are able to be considered at any point in a planning process on a project. Um, most of these structures are, everything that you need to know to design them is included in, in ASHTO and ASTM. However, most of these structures are going to be designed by the manufacturer. And if you come to them with basic project requirements, they sh any qualified manufacturer should be able to help you, help to determine appropriate geometry and, and design to move forward with. Uh, great separations are, are pretty are pretty common uh, because of flexibility. There's of the structures. There's a there are a lot of things that you can deal with from from geotechnical challenges that might be harder to deal with with other types of structures. Um, these are often a single span alternative to multi cell crossings. Uh, you know, if, if these are constructed and, and designed and constructed properly, along with the, the right types of foundations, you're not going to have that bump at the end of the bridge that you would have with a rigid structure or a traditional type of bridge. Um, it, one of the big, biggest uh, benefits that, that I hear about, especially with public works and county engineers, is the, the very low maintenance cost and the ease of, ease of inspection and operation. Um, when after these structures are built at the road level, there's no more maintenance than you would normally have for a road. There's no bridge deck, there are no joints or things like that uh, to inspect or maintain. Um, and then on the inside, the you know the structures basically consist of two components. It's just the plates and the bolts that that are used to connect them to each other. Um, visual inspe inspection is very easy to do, and just by monitoring the shape, you can tell how the structure is doing. And also, finally, through soil structure interaction, it, these are able to carry very heavy loads. Um, they're pretty common in the mining industries for haul trucks and mining shovels and things like that. Uh, so from, from a transportation perspective, the, the live loads, especially with load rating and things like that, that's a very minor concern on most projects. One one question that always comes up when we're talking about galvanized steel structures is what type what type of service life are we going to have, um, and what does the durability look like? Uh, when most most people, the idea that most people have with durability and service life from galvanized steel comes from corrugated steel pipe. Uh, when we're talking about corrugated steel pipe, those structures all have inverts on them, um, which is usually where where you start to see issues at the end of the service life of the structure. A vast majority of these structures have no invert, so there's there's no uh, there's no abrasion that's taking place uh, from flowing water because it's not flowing against the bottom of the structure or or the the invert of the structure. Structures that do have inverts are usually buried quite a bit. Uh, they're 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 built that way primarily for um, foundation support reasons, and the bottoms are filled in with some some sort of uh, of a non-corrosive fill material. So e even with the inverts, they're not going to have abrasion happening in the invert. Uh, in addition to that, the galvanizing weight on, on these types of structures is about 50% more than what it is with corrugated steel pipe. And these are also much higher steel thickness. Uh, corrugated steel pipe usually tops out around eight gauge thickness. And these structures start around eight gauge and will go up to about a third of an inch thick. So there's a lot more material there, uh, which results in longer service life and, and better durability. Um, aside from that, there are a lot of things that can be controlled during the design and construction by the owner and, and the designer to prevent anything that might be uh, detrimental to, to galvanized steel from touching the structure in terms of the, of the soil and water 
used on soil, soil and water at the site. Um, so it, it, even if a, even if you're at a site that might have some some low pH soils or corrosive types of soils, that's good to know because then you know you don't want to use that material to be in contact with the structure. You want to import a non-corrosive backfill material. Uh, in fact, these these structures specify uh, electrochemical properties that are consistent with those used already specified in AASHTO section 11 for me mechanically stabilized earth retaining walls with steel reinforcing. So in, in general terms, if you follow those guidelines, you should be able to achieve a 75-year design life for a galvanized steel buried bridge. Uh, if there are additional concerns, uh, other features can be added like splash walls, secondary coatings, um, like a, in, in northern states, it's becoming common now to use HDPE membranes within the backfill above the structure to intercept and, and to help shed de-icing salts. Um, you know, anything like that. If, there, if there's something like that, that, that there's a concern on a project, bring that up to the designer and that can usually be dealt with fairly inexpensively during the, during the design process and original construction. Uh, and aside from that, you know, that, that's, that's really just the, the dealing with the structure itself, but there are other design, design considerations that can affect the service life. Uh, when you're looking at the properly designed and built foundations, um, the appropriate site grading, um, surface drainage, hydraulic design, those are all things that are really independent of the material of the, of the, the bridge the bridge itself. Those are all things that are designed by usually the civil engineer on site. So that also needs to be done properly. And, and if those things aren't done the way they're supposed to be, that could affect the ser service life as well. And then of course, there's a quality of construction. So the the main lesson here though, is, is that it's really kind of a team effort to achieve the de desired durability and service life on buried bridges. It really depends on proper design and installation and then maintaining it and using it for the, for the, the structure for what it was intended to be used for. So in the end, it, it's really the end user or the owner has, has a much greater impact and control on the service life of a structure than the designer does or the manufacturer. Um, so it's important to have those, construct, those discussions early on in the process. So I'm going to move on to, to three three case studies and then a few snapshots at the end. Um, these were the, the I just noticed these are all in the eastern part of the country, but uh, they're really selected because of the the different types of projects they were. Uh, these types of projects are happening all over the United States and, and really internationally as well. So this first one is in Attleboro, Massachusetts. Uh, the the project is uh, is located on I-95, just north of the Rhode Island border. Uh, there, at this location, there, there was a plan to rebuild two three-lane interstate highway bridges, um, carrying I-95 traffic, uh, and also crossing a, a, local, a local road, North Avenue. The project was originally designed to have a temporary bridge constructed in the median, uh, sort of a, a Bailey bridge or other similar type of truss bridge system where they could move traffic, uh, the three lanes of traffic from one of the existing bridges onto the temporary bridge while that bridge was replaced and then do the same thing in the other direction for the other bridge. Uh, one of the contractors approached us to see if there might be a buried bridge solution that could be used here that would be quicker to build and more cost effective. Uh, so we looked at that. Uh, we they were able to provide the clearance requirements for North Avenue and the elevations that we had to stay below to not change the road elevation for the interstate, and we were able to come up with a custom shape that that worked and met all the met all the technical requirements of the project. The end result was that uh, the Berry Bridge solution saved four months on the project and over a million dollars, and ultimately won the project for the contractor. Um, so this was a true accelerator bridge construction alternative and also value engineered. Uh, the structure consisted of 100 plates. Each plate was two and a half feet wide, it consisted of three plates per ring. Um, the contractor never built one of these structures before and was able to assemble the whole thing in, uh, in one, or in two, basically two ships, one long day. Uh, the, the local authorities gave them a weekend to build the structure and he was able to do that in one day. Uh, this also incorporated welded wire MSE headwalls 
uh, to help keep the bridge length down and to avoid conflicts with the new bridge abutments. So the contractor, in order to speed up construction, uh, pre-assembled the three crown plates in the structure as one piece. And then after getting his initial rings built, he would bring, he would set the two side plates and then bring in the three crown plates basically as one plate. Uh, that, that little backhoe you see there is the biggest piece of equipment they had on the site during the assembly. This was in, uh, in the spring of the year. So, um, you know, in Massachusetts, of course, it snowed because everyone wanted to get done fast, but they were able to, able to get through it uh, and everybody was pretty happy with the way things went. This gives you an idea of the, the size of the structure. This, this was about a 56 and a half foot span at the bottom and designed for a two lane, basically a two lane highway clearance plus shoulders on the inside. Uh, so you can see there's plenty of room to spare there around that dumpster truck. Uh, this is a Im image of them just kind of wrapping up the backfill. You can see some of the some of the grid from the, the MSC headwalls that they were using there. This is just a temporary structure. It was in place for about two years and then taken down. So there wasn't much care paid. You know, they didn't pay much attention to what it looked like at the end because it just had to be functional. If this was a permanent structure there, there would have been some other type of facing or, or they would have used a, like a rock face on those walls. <clears throat> Uh, here they are getting ready for paving. Th this structure was included with the NCHRP 1554 uh, study, which was looking at load rating of, of uh, culverts and buried structures. Uh, so this structure was instrumented and tested before and after paving, and they and they found that the uh, the live load response in the structure was much less than what was predicted from the analysis. So it performed very well with carrying those loads. And here it was after it was in service for about a year. You can see the new bridge off to the off to the right, and then they're working on the other one. So th this project has since completed. Uh, if you want to go look for it, it's not there anymore. Uh, but if you if you want to go buy it from the contractor who who took it down, he may not have recycled it yet. Uh, this this next structure was about the same size, uh, slightly smaller than than the than the Attleboro one, but a much different application. Uh, this one's located in Black Mountain, North Carolina. Uh, the this was built as to to access a new a new uh, v Veterans Affairs facility, nursing home. Um, it's on on a local road. There was about 15 feet from the invert of this of this drainage stream to to the road that they that we had to work with uh, they had a kind of kind of a unique hydraulic requirement of a 48 foot minimum span at six feet above the invert of the of the creek which i believe was for debris flows for the 100 year flood in addition to that there was some, some scour concerns at the site um, there was a need to avoid limits of disturbance which is pretty common in most parts of the country and a sloping transverse grade so the road across the bridge was sloping early on in the in the design process they were looking at a, a traditional bridge span uh, but that would have required over a hundred foot span and, and had some pretty substantial foundations just based on the how on how the creek banks lay, laid back and and what the, the site conditions were So the, the project was originally specified as a 48 foot span precast arch structure uh, with a 12 foot rise on, um, on deep foundations. So this structure because of, because of the low rise was going to have about eight feet of cover on it and, and some pretty substantial loading um, and, and pretty good sized footing. So the contractor asked us to, to value engineer a, a flexible buried bridge option. So we, we were able to come up with one. It, it had the, the structure bearing at the same elevation as a precast structure, <clears throat> uh, but, but because shipping wasn't an issue with this structure, we were able to increase the rise and reduce the cover on it. Uh, it achieved the minimum span requirement where they had it. And then we also included uh, sheet pile cutoff walls on the inside of the foundations that were pushed down to the scour depth of the stream, basically armoring the foundations against scour.
So we were able to get some pretty good information from the contractor comparing the two options. Um, you can see on the top line here that the, the structures themselves installed costs were fairly similar, certainly not different enough to justify using one over the other. Um, I just want to point out the big difference here between the two was that with the flexible structure, we went back to the geotechnical engineer and explained the settlement tolerances of the structure. And he was able to provide a higher allowable bearing pressure, which made spread footings feasible for the project. Uh, th and that was not the case for the precast structure. So in this case, all other things being equal, the big difference was just the cost of the foundation system, which resulted in a 45% reduction in cost with using the flexible structure. And this is very common on a lot of buried bridge projects. Uh, that, that's one question that I always ask up front, and, and we usually are able to get a, a higher allowable bearing pressure to make it a much more economically feasible um, solution. So just a few construction pictures here. Uh, you can see the, <clears throat> the sheet pile cutoff wall here, which also doubled as formwork for the footings. It made things pretty convenient and reduced the amount of disturbance in, in the stream area. This was also a five plate per ring structure. Uh, they used a modular block head walls on it. Uh, they, these types of structures are compatible with just about any type of head wall system. Uh, but mechanically stabilized earth seems, seems to really work the best because it has a similar settlement tolerance and flexibility that the structures have. At this site, they had low resistivity uh, granular soils. Um, they didn't meet our electrochemical property requirements, so we just didn't use them as backfill right next to the structure. We used, a, we used a higher resistivity material, and then those other materials were used outside of that zone. So this would be an example where um, the site soils had some potential, some, some moderately corrosive materials, but we were able to get around using those by just bringing in some imported material, which was not a significant increase in cost. We tried to, to get them to find a, a big truck to, to get some measurements of the deflection of the structure under live loads, but unfortunately the heaviest thing they had uh, was this little water truck. Um, we tried it anyway and, and couldn't even tell that this, if the structure deflected at all under that load. So here, here it is about a year later. Um, most people driving over this don't even know that they're going over a bridge. Uh, from the road level, you can't hardly tell it's there. So the final case study is, is out in Maine. Uh, so it's a smaller structure, about a 20, 28 foot span by six foot three rise. Um, this is this is actually a, a bridge replacement for, for a 20 foot span steel and concrete bridge. Um, because of where it is, there were limitations on how high it could be made. Um, so, so there's sort of a tight window to fit the structure in to meet to meet the geometry requirements. They wanted to leave the foundations for the existing bridge in sight and actually incorporate them into the new footings uh, for the new structure, and then also reconfigure the head walls. Uh, there were some safety issues and and with the existing head walls for the bridge, um, and and they weren't working the way they were supposed to hydraulically. So this so so picture of what the existing bridge looks like pretty you know pretty typical and I think you see a lot of these in in uh, in county roads throughout the country. Another view of that you can see the kind of the short stub nosed wing walls, uh, not not the safest situation and and not very effective uh, for helping with with hydraulics at the site. Uh, the, the stream actually runs parallel to the road and crosses underneath it and then sort of sort of an S curve there as it goes through and continues on. This was, this was originally specified as an aluminum box culvert structure. Um, they opted to ended up going with uh, the deep corrugated steel structure um, mainly mainly for cost and because it, it was going going to be quicker to install without any ribs on it. The, the footings were designed to tie into the existing bridge abutment, which were just cut off, basically cut off at uh, at about the footing elevation. Um, 
which was really nice because it served as as helping with uh, you know they remain remaining in place to help with scour control and and also to pile up a little bit of riprap up against the structure uh, to to help with high flows. So they doweled in and basically reused the existing foundations for the new bridge. The contractor built this by pre-assembling uh, sets of three rings off to the side and then lowering them onto place on the footing, um, connecting them down there. It took about, I think it took about three or four hours for this. Um, so very fast to get the bridge in place. And then by the end of the day, they were able to start backfilling. Uh, the, again, the, the biggest piece of equipment they had on this site was was the backhoe, which they, they took the bucket off and used that to, to lower the rings into place. So very quick and simple. Um, I'll, I'll, there are a number of counties around the country that will will buy these structures and they'll install them themselves. Um, and, and most manufacturers will provide whatever level of support you need to help with that. Usually they'll volunteer to do some sort of a pre-construction meeting to go over the drawings and the things to watch for. And, and usually there'll even be somebody on site to help get started. So there, there's a lot of support available. Um, and, and a lot of these structures are built by by county crews and also even by earthwork contractors. Uh, this project was also somewhat unique because it, it was the first to use a, a different type of headwall system. This had structural structural plate headwalls on it, but instead of using a, the, a system that uses tiebacks and anchors to help support the walls, it was basically designed as a mechanically stabilized earth wall with using structural plate facing. Um, this was this was able to be done because of the this grid strip reinf soil reinforcing that was used that could just simply attach to the face of the the, the structural plate facing on the walls. Um, so that so this is all reinforced soil, uh, basically supporting itself rather than the wall holding back the soil using anchors. So one of the benefits with this is that there there are no whalers or dead men or anything like that. So it's a very clean very clean at the wall face, very simple to construct uh, because it has a basically two components, just just the facing and then the grid strip, and you can just add the grid strip as you're as you're back filling the structure as because the soil is reinforced, it will it will stand up until those the next layer of reinforcement is is installed, and you can pretty much build these walls about as fast as you can place the backfill. So this looks very different from the way it started. Uh, instead of having the, the bull-nosed wing walls, they basically just extended the head wall and provide a riprap on the banks there. So I'm going to wrap up my part with uh, just snapshots on a few other projects to, to give you some more ideas on some of the ways that these are being used. Uh, th this one here is in Knox County, Indiana. This is, a, this is a spur line to a power plant. So it's actually designed for E80 train loading. Uh, this is a 53-foot span arch uh, with about, I think it was about five, four and a half or five feet of cover on it also with skewed ends. That's why this looks rippled here because these plates are actually cut on a skew and they're supported with uh, cast in place concrete head walls. This project uh, is on I-75 going, <clears throat> going through Ohio. This was a, this is a 150 foot long, uh, 48 foot span arch structure actually specified by Ohio DOT, designed as a replacement to an existing interstate bridge uh, as part of a widening program. So they, they, built, they built the structure uh, and head walls on one end and, and then moved traffic over as they, as they removed the existing bridges and replaced it with the pavement. So this was, this was stage construction here. And this, this was all done without having to close the interstate. Uh, here's another project from Randolph, Nebraska about a 50 foot span by 17 foot ride box box shaped structure. This was designed to allow two semis to pass underneath it. This was a this is a um, 
had an agricultural facility where they had a loop track that went around the facility, but they needed to get materials in and outside the loop. So this was designed for the semis to pass underneath it and trains to go over the top. Uh, this one is also using mechanically stabilized earth head walls. Uh, this is a precast panel face system. Basically the same design as the one that I showed you from, from Maine with the structural plate facing, only this has precast instead. Um, this is a signature entrance for the owner of the facility, and so they elected to have somebody come in and actually hand paint the, the Ashler stone finish on the panels. Um, another project out in Irvine, California. This is at the old El Toro Marine Base. Uh, I was converted to, to City Park uh, Greenway um, and other recreational facilities. As part of that, they had four under, underpasses like the one shown here. Um, this is sort of a neat project because they they made a lot of effort with sustainability on it. Uh, they actually used, uh, they recycled the runway concrete to use as backfill for the structure. And they even took portions of the runway out to build park benches and other features around the project. Um, and another example, this is a, th a three barrel crossing. Each one of those barrels is, is uh, about a 30 foot span. Uh, this is also a, a mechanically stabilized earth head wall. Only in this case, they kept the face of the wall back so that they could they could build a stacked stone facing in front of it to match the surroundings of the area. So it's pu purely aesthetic, but in the background, it's ba it's basically just a mechanically stabilized earth wall. Um, this is an example of a, of a rehabilitation project where where the very bridges were used to to uh, to line an existing concrete arch under I-70 in Topeka, Kansas. So the structure was built a few rings at a time off the end of the structure and then slid into place onto a new footing on the inside. And then the space in between the liner and the existing concrete arch was grouted. So basically they they just created a new, a brand new structure inside there. And this was all without closing the road above. Um, this is just an example of, of aesthetically some of the things that you can do with these if, if you're in a park setting and you want a certain look. Uh, this is based, this is just a, a concrete head wall on, on these two structures here. They they wanted to do the, the brick inlay and have a certain look with the with the pilasters and, and other special features. Um, on, on this particular project, the structures themselves are probably the lowest cost part of the project because they, they did want they want this is their signature entrance. They wanted to look a certain way. Um, it is a project in in uh, in in Houston, Texas. Um, this was selected for partly for aesthetic reasons. The architect involved liked liked the wire wall look, and they actually used recycled concrete backfill for this structure as well. So the recycled content on this project was is probably pretty close to 95% or more. Um, so if that's one of if sustainability is one of your goals, that's something that could be considered. Uh, the, this project in Kansas is for a county road over a a, a spur line into a power plant. Uh, they had to create a grade separation for safety reasons, so they elected to take the county road over the top. And this structure was sized for a, a two-track Arima uh, rail tunnel clearance. The structure is about 150 feet long. Uh, th this project in Greensboro, South Carolina, is at a at a landfill, crossing an environmentally sensitive area. Uh, one unique aspect of this project was that there were pretty poor soil conditions. So the structure is actually sitting on a pile foundation. Uh, during backfilling, they had significant settlement of the backfill or of the existing soils next to the foundation. It settled more than one full course of the block, about a foot. Uh, usually when that happens, you, you put extra load on the structure, which causes excess deflection. There was some peaking that happened with this structure, uh, about 10 inches of peaking. Peaking is the upward movement as the fill is being placed at the crown. Um, so, so what what they ended up doing it actually caused a fair amount of damage to the wall. So they just took down part of the wall and rebuilt it. Um, the structure 
peaking came down and then uh, ended up in a, in a more acceptable location there. Um, to me, this was an, was an example of the resi resilience of these types of structures because it was able to accommodate so much, so much movement without permanent damage. Uh, if this would if this would have been a, a rigid structure, it probably there probably would have been enough damage to have to replace it. But in this case, it simply involved removing the fill and placing it back on again. Uh, and this is an example of a, of a picturesque wildlife crossing up in Canada, up up in the Banff area. So this also is using the precast panel head wall system, um, twin arches, and these are becoming these are becoming more common throughout the U.S. There there've been a fair number of them down in the West, and I know they're being they're being considered in other areas as well. So with that, I'm going to hand it off to to Mike, to Mike McGoff. Uh, Mike is the technical director at the National Corrugated Steel Pipe Association. Last few slides. Thank you uh, again, everybody, for for joining us this afternoon. I'm going to wrap this up here with um, just just some overview and general technical resource information for everybody uh, when they get back to to their computers and, and their daily life. They have some information that they can point to and read, and and some specifications that they can begin to look at. Um, so you know, of course, on the material side. Uh, Ashto and ASTM are the primary drivers of specification. So uh, Ashto M167 and ASTM A761 uh, are the material specs. So these are titled standard specification for corrugated steel structural plate, zinc coated for field bolted pipe, pipe arches or arches. Uh, and then there's a third standard material standard newly developed, which is the standard specification for corrugated steel structural plate, polymer coated, for field bolted pipe, pipe arches and arches. Uh, so those are the three material standards primarily. Uh, on the design side, uh, Ashto LRFD is the primary driver there. So section 12, 12.8.9 uh, in particular, uh, loads come from section three. Uh, and then uh, ASTM A796 is the installation standard there from, or the, excuse me, the design standard there for, for ASTM. Uh, on the construction and installation uh, side of things, you have the Ashto Bridge Construction Specification, Section 26. Uh, that covers pipe uh, and uh, structural plate structures. And then you have ASTM A798. Uh, there are also standards available through ARIMA. ARIMA is the, the Railroad uh, Association, uh, as well as uh, through FAA. These next couple of slides uh, are, are really just kind of a recap of, of what uh, Joel talked about early on. Uh, these discuss the materials properties of, of the plate uh, with M167. Uh, M167 also contains details on connections, um, bolt holes, bolt spacing, et cetera. Uh, you know, Joel also touched on the differences between shallow and deep corrugated. Um, next, uh, from the design side of things, you have the general design inputs here. Uh, there are some special considerations that, that will be made for um, low profile uh, and deep corrugated structures that, that aren't covered here. Uh, you know, we, we could spend a whole nother hour uh, just talking about design uh, on these types of structures, but, but this will give you a list of, of the basic considerations. Um, and, and what you can do there is, is you can take this and and if, if you want to, and, and we talked about some software earlier, uh, you can do finite element uh, modeling uh, with this through Candy, through Plaxis. Um, these are just some screenshots of, of how that would look uh, and as you work through the loads incrementally, uh, stage loading. Uh, here uh, is a moment diagram and, and, and live loads uh, being applied uh, through, through the modeling software, and then uh, for, for a more basic approach, uh, Eastman 140 has been developed through the Shortsman Steel Bridge Alliance, and, and that allows you to enter in early on some of the basic parameters, span, length, um, traffic count, rise, 
height of cover, minimum height of cover uh, into the system. And what it will do is, is it will populate uh, through the inventory contained within uh, a, a solutions book that will allow you to see what types of structures would meet uh, the needs of your project. Now, again, these are pretty basic designs. It's not something you can go and take to the design table, but uh, it allows you to get an idea of what's available. And then, of course, you contract your, your local uh, manufacturer to, uh, to, to work through uh, final stages, right? So, uh, you know, again, short span steel bridge alliance covers a, a number of, of steel solutions. Uh, as we've talked about before, uh, Melissa covered them early on. This is the, the members and the partners within the short span steel bridge alliance. the activities that the Alliance undergoes. And then of course, uh, here's some contact information for Dan. Dan's the director for the Short Span Steel Bridge Alliance. Uh, Dan, thank you for putting this all together. Uh, of course, the next webinar in, in this series is gonna be next week on the 12th at the same, same time, 3 p.m. Uh, Dr. Greg Michelson with Marshall going to talk about uh, development of the eastband 140 standards uh and then i'm going to wrap it up with two more slides here for the ncspa uh another great resource of course uh for bridges for culverts storm sewers etc uh we have our corrugated steel pipe design manual that you can download uh there's the ncspa installation guide service life selection guide a number of calculators etc uh, we are also following suit with a number of other organizations, SSBA included, uh, going to be hosting our own uh, webinars moving forward. Uh, the first of which will be next, or excuse me, in two weeks on the 14th of May. Uh, details will be forthcoming. Uh, AGA has uh, also graciously agreed to partner with us uh, in hosting those. Uh, so they will be coming through this same platform as well. Uh, so look forward to those, and we hope to see many of you on, on those future webinars. And with that, I'll close it up, and we can, uh, we can get to questions. Mm -hmm.